Welcome to CMES Conversations, a series of interviews with leading scholars and thinkers hosted by the University of Denver's Center for Middle East Studies. This week on CMES Conversations, Associate Director Danny Postel interviews George Irani, an Associate Professor of International Relations at the American University of Kuwait. He is the author of The Papacy in the Middle East, The Role of the Holy See in the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1962-1984. And he is the co-editor of Regional and Ethnic Conflicts, Perspectives from the Front Lines. He is also a contributor to the books Paving the Way, Contributions of Interactive Conflict Resolution to Peacemaking, edited by Ronald Fisher and Between Terror and Tolerance, Religious Leaders, Conflict, and Peacemaking, edited by Timothy Sisk. In April of 2015, the University of Denver's Center for Middle East Studies was pleased to host Professor Irani as a Carnegie Centennial Visiting Scholar. Thank you for joining us once again on this episode of CMES Conversations. Professor Irani, welcome back to Denver. It's really great to have you here. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Professor, you've written the following. I just want to quote this particular paragraph from an article that you wrote addressing long-term changes. Actually, the title of the article is The Arab World in the Throes of Long-Term Change. And you write the following about your native Lebanon. Lebanon is a failing state. Like Humpty Dumpty, outside powers have tried unsuccessfully to patch the country's various communities together. Lebanon is facing a major upheaval in light of the constant influx of Syrian refugees, almost one million. This is a heavy burden for a country of four million inhabitants. Add to that that Lebanon is being slowly sucked into the Syrian maelstrom. Let's start with the beginning. What do you mean when you say that Lebanon is a failing state? The, the term itself is a, is a bit controversial. The last few years there has been a series of articles and studies creating some ranking classifications of states arbitrary, mostly by Western scholars, talking about weak states, strong states, weak states, failed states, and collapsed states. Now we have a new category called fragile states. Which my colleague and your friend That's Tim right. Sisk That's right. is intimately involved That's right. in the research on that topic. <clears throat> That's right. In the case of Lebanon, what I'm saying is a failed state because it has never been a state in the Western sense of the word. Because in the Middle East, we, we don't have nation states like in Europe. Uh, we have you know, communities. We have tribally dominated states. The only nation state in the Arab world is Egypt. Okay? Egypt which has a long history, cohesive population, and if you want more stable governance. The case of Lebanon, uh, when it was created in 1943, it was based on this compromise, the national pact between Christians and Muslims. At that time, the Maronite Christians and the Sunni Muslims and the Shia. The Christians at that time were a majority, a slight majority. And the French had governed Lebanon for 20 years under the mandate that came from the famous Sykes-Picot Agreement. So, so they created this entity which was supposed to be a refuge for the Christians of the Middle East. People forget that in the Middle East today you have more than 15 million Christians between Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iraq Palestine, and of course North Africa. They are dwindling, by the way, unfortunately. So when I say it's, 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 a, it's a failing state because it is always a, a prey to internal and external uh, tensions and contradictions. So in 1958, for instance, there was a struggle in the Middle East during the Cold War between Arab nationalism uh, under Gamal Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian president, and the United States. And Nasser wanted to create the, uh, the um, Arab Union, the United Arab Republic, if you want. So he wanted to include Lebanon and Syria within that framework. 
He succeeded with Syria not for too long. But in Lebanon, the president at that time, Kamil Shamon, refused, and as he was uh, an ally of the United States. So what happened is that there was a small civil war in Lebanon. Okay. But the message was that Lebanon was used as a platform to quell another uh, change or revolution, at least, which was in Iraq. At that time, there was a coup against the king of Iraq, Faisal. And uh, that was perceived to be a threat. We're talking the about the late 1950s now. That's right. Well, no, 1958, basically. Eight. Yeah. So, so basically, the United States, President Eisenhower, sent in the Marines. They only stayed one month. It was, in a sense, like a cakewalk. It was not you know, too much happening, basically. But that was uh, that time. Then in 1975, we have another civil war or internal war with regional and global implications. It was due to the fact that the United States was trying to push the peace process, the Arab-Israeli peace process, following President Sadat's visit to Israel, the Camp David Accords. So you had the Arab world lining up in two sides, one group supporting this peace process, another group, including Syria, Iraq, Libya, and others, that were against the peace process. So Lebanon was chosen to be as the, the theater, if you want. In this whole picture, let's not forget that the Palestine Liberation Organization had installed itself, created a base in Lebanon itself. So that created a beginning of, of a conflict that lasted for, oh my God, from 1975 to 1990 almost. Fifteen years. Fifteen years, right. Which included the uh, Syrian intervention in Lebanon, 1976, Israeli invasion, 1982, uh, Arafat forced, yes, Arafat, the late head of the PLO, forced out of Beirut, and then he went with his people to, to Tunisia. Um, and and mo more tensions and the emergence of Hezbollah as the Iranian factor in the uh, Lebanese equation. In the early 80s. In the early 80s, right, right. So, in a sense, Lebanon is not immune from what's going on in the neighborhood, from what's going on internally and what goes on in, in the neighborhood. So that's, the, that's why I say it's, it's a fragile state. Okay, I want to go both backwards and forwards. Backwards to something that you mentioned a moment ago, Sykes-Picot. We mm -hmm. are now in the hundredth year. Next year will be one century since the signing of the Sykes-Picot Accord. You have actually talked about the historical moment that the Middle East faces today. You framed it as Sykes-Picot to Obama-Putin. Explain, first of all, let's go back to Sykes-Picot. Talk a little bit about not just what it was, but why it matters today. Well, Sykes-Picot is, is a reflection of the colonial, if you want, uh, hegemony and meddling in many uh, developing countries. Um, this was part also of redesigning borders in Africa, for instance. Okay. In the case of Saxe-Picot, which by the way was a secret agreement, by the way, and then right. after the maps were revealed and so on. And uh, it was also part of the jockeying for spheres of influence between the French and the British in the, in the Levant, in the Middle East. In the aftermath of World the War collapse I. of the Ottoman Empire That's right. in, in, at the end of World War I. That's right. So, so basically, the, the French uh, well, took control of Lebanon and Syria, and the British took control of Iraq, Palestine, uh, all the way down to the Gulf, to Kuwait, Egypt, and so on. And this is why they created these entities that are collapsing today, entities based on minority rule, meaning that in Lebanon, the Maronite Christians were uh, chosen as the ruling elite, in uh, Syria, we have another minority, the Alawis uh, in, uh, in Syria. And then in Iraq, we had the Sunnis, exemplified by Saddam Hussein's family and so on and so forth. So in a sense, we had the creation of fragile states. From, okay. the ver from their very inception. From the very inception. And in the case of Syria and Iraq, in the initial stages, of when they got their independence, they had a liberal bout, if you want, of political parties, elections. But then the 1960s, 50s, 60s, you begin having turmoil. Uh, there coups. were coups in Syria every two weeks or one week or whatever. <laughs> and then the same thing in Iraq. Yeah. So you had the emergence of the Ba'ath Party, the Party of the Resurrection. In both Syria and Iraq. And Iraq, but that's right. That basically the party was manipulated by these 
ruthless leaders such as you know Bash uh, Hafez al-Assad in Syria and Saddam Hussein in, uh, in Europe. So these two, if you want, try to create, to create, if you want, states from a conglomerate of nations. So in the case of Iraq, you have the Kurds, you have the Sunnis, you have the Shias, and the various spl uh, splattering of, of minorities, Christian minorities, Assyrians, and so on. Um, in the case of Syria, the same thing. So in a sense, the force was used to basically force all the citizens to follow one identity, which is the national identity, Iraqi identity. Or and Baathism, in that sense, was an attempt to forge a unified right. Arab nationalist, which That's of course right. excluded the Kurds. That's right. But it was an attempt to <clears throat> kind of, it was a trans cross-sectarian ideology, at least in the yeah, principle. Yeah, it was actually similar to what happened in other uh, 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 spheres, other countries, like the case of the former Yugoslavia. Right, when, Titoism. Uh, Marshal Tito unified, basically told the Croats, the Serbs, the Bosnians, the Montenegrans, and so on, said, folks, forget about your ethnic identity, we are all Yugoslav. Right. So, uh, unfortunately, these models didn't work. They, they collapsed. So this is what basically what I'm saying is that the borders created by the French-British agreement at that time, 100 years ago, are, are crumbled. So what we have today, if you look at the map of the Middle East, we have Syria has crumbled. Syria as we've known it is finished. As, as a, you don't think you, it's recoverable or retrievable? I don't think the Sunni Syrians will accept, ever accept to be ruled by, by Bashar al-Assad and his clique, basically, because there's been a lot of blood. 250,000 people killed, loss of destruction, and a huge amount of refugees. So they will never accept to go back to, to rule him. He basically is making sure now that he has his own Alawi area under control. I foresee, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I foresee some kind of, uh, you know, not confederal, but autonomous regions, each one ruling itself uh, in that frame. The same thing in Iraq too. Uh, Which is de facto happening already. That's right. With the establishment of basically a Kurdish yes. state in yes. all but name. Yes. And the Shia state in the south. Yes. Right. Well, if they want to call it Shia state. And then we have the Sunni areas. We don't know yet what the outcome will, will that be. Now, to fast forward for a second, in a sense, isn't ISIS, the rise of ISIS, can't it be seen as precisely a response to the artificiality or unworkability of the Sykes-Pico borders. Isn't that what ISIS is in effect saying? Is that these borders are completely fake, they mean nothing, and what we need is to establish or re-establish, to recover the original Islamic state, pre-European nation state, pre-colonial, pre-modern. I, I think that a lot is being done about ISIS. I think that their power and influence have been pushed beyond limits. Uh, I live in the Middle East, in Kuwait, and the region of Freeman to Beirut too. I can assure you that the majority of the population doesn't care too much about the ISIS message and their, their uh, lunatic uh, fringes. Uh, they represent what? They represent ISIS, Daesh, whatever you want to call them. They represent the failure of the Arab order the failure of the regimes to provide to their people the basic needs to provide justice, uh, to provide you know, a sense of citizenship. Okay? And I think that the so-called Arab Spring was a reflection of that, that the youth, which are the majority of the population of the Arab world, Iran too, they are expressing their discontent with the authoritarian, dictatorial powers and so on. So ISIS basically is trying to fill that gap but they will not succeed. Okay. They're trying to fill the gap that was left by, in a sense, the failure of yes. the Arab uprisings, right? By the failure, not only the Arab uprising, but the failure of the Arab regimes right. to answer their people's needs and concerns and yearnings. Yes. And, and we, we find this in the case of Lebanon, we find the case of Palestine, we find in the case of Iraq, find in the case of Egypt, and so on. So what we have today is a collapse, if you want, of the Arab order. And on top of that, we have what someone has called the new Arab Cold War. Mm. Okay. In the 1950s, the late Professor Malcolm Kerr, who Father was, 
of Steve Kerr yes. of the Chicago Bulls, now That's coach right. of the Golden State Warriors. Just wanted to throw that That's footnote right. in for basketball fans. That's right. Malcolm Kerr was a very prominent figure in yes. Middle East studies who yes. was the dean, I believe. He was the president of the American president University of Beirut. He was the, killed, by the way. Exactly. He was assassinated in, in Lebanon. And his wife, Anne Kerr, wrote a beautiful book uh, about their, because both of them, both Anchor and her husband, were born in, in the Middle East, were born, I think, in Egypt, if I'm not wrong. And uh, basically, uh, uh, he wrote a book, short, very important book, called The Arab Cold War. That was a reflection of what was going on between, you know, Nasser, Arab nationalism, and Western in you know, the Cold War. Yes. Okay, and how various Arab regimes lined up on the Nasser side or against Nasser. For instance, Jordan, Lebanon, probably Syria, where mostly was pro-Western. Right. Then you had Iraq uh, um, and other uh, Arab regimes that were more on the Nasser side. Right. Iraq, of course, right. and Jordan. And of course, the Saudis most prominently on the US side. That's right, okay. So this is what we, so Daesh, what is it, ISIS, is a reflection of that failure. And I think also as a reflection beyond the, the failure of the Arab order, is the failure of US foreign policy. Mm. A failure of U.S. foreign policy that, you know, the Bush administration, before invading Iraq, they never had a plan B. And many American experts and scholars, and here where, you know, one feels a sense of frustration that we have great centers like yours and others who have been publishing warnings and policy papers and so on. They were never listened to. And basically we had the invasion of Iraq, the destruction of a nation, this is what happened. Millions of people dying billions of dollars uh, squandered, and a country today that is a shambles. Okay, so that's, this is where ISIS came. And this is why they recruited, for instance, all these former Iraqi officers in the Iraqi army right. who were dismissed. Right, who had so nowhere to go with debothification no and the, essentially right. the dismantling of the Iraqi that's state right. apparatus. That's right. that's right. In the meanwhile, keep in mind too that you had also the, the, the there was the, the Al-Qaeda factor, which if you want, ISIS is the most extreme, extreme reflection. So Al Qaeda in Iraq develops in the in during the U.S. occupation. Uh, yes, the destruction, yes. The, yes. De the 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 fall of Saddam Hussein. You have during the occupation this Al Qaeda chapter in Iraq, which is really started by the Jordanian jihadi yes. Al Zarqawi, right. and then it's kind of it it almost dissolves essentially mm -hmm. by a decade later, and then. It reemerges yes. in this particular context of the uh, well. Many would argue the 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 Shia state that emerges after the the new Iraq that emerges um, after the fall of Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein. That's right. So uh, that's Maliki's government, yeah. the sectarianization, if you will, of Iraqi politics. That's right. That's right. And so, and then of course, it spreads into Syria, where you have this civil war, ISIS is basically filling vacuums. It's not filling vacuums, it's playing on the frustration of people. And ISIS is not the only play player. There are hundreds of groups, Jibhat al-Nusra and Ahl al-Bayd and Ahl al-Sunnah and so on and so on. All kinds of small splinter groups that are all the creation of intelligence. Intelligence, Arab intelligence and foreign intelligence, be it Turkish, be it Qatari, be it American, be it others, who basically fund these groups for different purposes to destabilize, including the Syrian regime itself. Mm. The Syrian regime basically was in its interest to, in a sense, allow the emergence of Daesh, especially in the north northwestern part of um, of Iraq. North I think that's a western part of uh, eastern part of Syria. That's sorry. right. Yeah, well, Raqqa, Raqqa and yeah. so on. So basically, because they wanted to keep the opposition busy fighting each other, the that's famous right. divide and rule uh, strategy. And I think that's a key point, George, because a lot of people are often surprised to learn that in fact, when ISIS first enters Syria about a year ago, two years ago, most of their shooting battles were actually against the Free Syrian Army, not against the Assad regime. And likewise, the Assad regime's firepower was directed mostly at the Free Syrian Army and, its, and the civilians within those areas under its control, not against ISIS or the jihadi groups. There was, in a sense, a, an unspoken agreement right. uh, between the Assad regime and ISIS that they both had the common enemy of the Syrian right. uprising. Absolutely, right. 
So, George, let's get back for a second to the geopolitics of this, because you talk about from Sykes-Picot to Obama-Putin. You pose a very provocative question at the end of this essay where you say, are we now seeing a new carving up of the Middle East into U.S. and Russian spheres of influence complemented and assisted by the three non-Arab regional powers of Turkey, Iran, and Israel? Talk about that a little bit. What exactly does this geopolitical constellation look like today? You know what? should not exaggerate these, the, these realities, because certainly the people of the region still have their own uh, governance or gov governments, if you want to put it that way. Uh, the thing is that global powers and regional powers are manipulating, if you want, the failure. Okay? So the, the Russians and the Chinese, especially the Russians, have had a long history of supporting the Russian, uh, Syrian regime, okay, all the way back to Hafez al-Assad and so on billions of dollars of weapons and help to the uh, Syrian regime. This was during the Cold War and then it extends Afterward, after the Cold right. War. Right. And, and basically the Russians would like to have a, a port on, on, the, on the Mediterranean. This is why they have some kind of uh, military presence in Tartus, yes. port in northern Syria. And Latakia. And uh, Latakia, that's right. Uh, uh, the Chinese follow they're not as keen on, on, on you know, showing off, if you want, but the Chinese also trying to maintain their interests in, in, in that part of the world. And unfortunately, these, if you want, the power struggle we have today, which was called, again, the New Cold War, not the Arab Cold War, the New Cold War, the United States and, and Russia, is, again, this issue about the spheres of influence. Yes. Okay? And the other thing, too, is that I think for the United States, the Middle East is not anymore a priority. Okay. The so-called pivot to Asia, P yes, which didn't really happen, actually, partly because of the Syrian civil war, the emergence of ISIS, the crisis in Iraq. Obama found that he couldn't really get away from the That's Middle right. East, despite his intentions. That's right. So but that, there was a desire right. to get away from it. Yes. But they, it, it will happen. I think that the, the attempt to reach an agreement with the Iranian regime, the nuclear uh, treaty, I think is very important in a sense is let's bring Iran back as a major player, especially in the Gulf, a policeman like at the time of the Shah. Right. I think we're headed that way. Okay. Which is freaking out a lot of people in the Middle East That's and right. across That's some right. interesting boundaries, That's which right. is to say the Israelis are obviously completely apoplectic about it, but so are the Saudis, so are right. the Emiratis and so forth. Right. We have to be careful here. The Israelis, I don't think they are all apoplectic. No, I, think I should say the Netanyahu, regime, yes. yeah, the, the Likudniks. Yeah, the Likudniks. Even among the Likudniks, there are people who, approve, who, who, who do not mind this agreement. Yes. Uh, and Mossad, for example, came out and said, ex-Mossad yeah. chiefs yes. said very clearly, yes. Netanyahu is wildly exaggerating yes. the yes. Iranian threat. That's right. And so forth. So we shouldn't say the Israelis writ right. large, but the ruling faction Right, BB crying wolf, basically. Yes. Right. So that's one. Two, uh, so, so Iran, important player, uh, will be back. Now, how the neighbors perceive it, living in Kuwait, I know clearly people are scared of or Kuwaitis and others of the Iranian factor. Uh, um, but I don't think, like, if you take countries like, for instance, Kuwait, Kuwait today, if you want, is under, you know, direct U.S. protectorate. Right. There are several U.S. bases there, and uh, I think the British too. There's actually a strategic agreement between, yeah. United, between Britain and the Kuwaiti uh, state to protect the state from any instability. This and goes so. back to 1990 with the Iraqi invasion of well Kuwait. Well before, well before. Even before. Yeah, before, because the British basically are the, those who created the state of Kuwait. Yes, but I mean with the U.S. agreement right. with Kuwait is especially solidified in 1990. That's right. Uh, uh, Saudi, that's another ball game. That we get to another failure. And it is the ideological failure, okay? That basically all the, the uh, playing with v different ideologies of back to the Ba'ath Party, to socialism, to communism, to liberalism in the Arab world failed dismally, okay? All of these ideological waves. That's right. The last being the, the, the Palestine Liberation Organization, you know, the using some of the Marxist theories and so on and so forth. It did not fly, it did not work. I think that uh, 67 was a major turning point of, for these so-called ideologies. Uh, 
and then the return, if you want, of the uh, uh, revival, of Islamic revival, I call it, I don't call it fundamentalism. Right. Because fundamentalism was a word used in terms of Christianity, mm. the, 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 the literal interpretation of the right. Bible, which is not the case, because Islam has gone through cycles in its history of, you know, revival and, you know, decadence and then revivalism, return back to the Salafi uh, right. uh, uh, tradition and so on and so forth. Because basically, uh, 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 there has been this sense of, you know, frustration, the inability of the Arabs to create their modern nation states compared to Iran. That's why today, for instance, we have this deep hatred between the Persians and the Arabs. We've always had it for a long time, because the Persians believe, the Iranians believe that they have a long history long tradition, uh, culture, and pre -Islamic, so on. Pre-Islamic, so pre-Arab. Right. Pre-Arab and post also, and then also that they have a solid, you know, state, yes. government, compared to the neighbors that are all creation. Except for Egypt, as you say, exactly. and arguably Yemen, but basically, yes. yes right. So Arab this world. is where you have this, this, uh, this thing. So I think that today the Saudis are really trying to hold the fort, if you want, yes. and draw the red line in Yemen. Now that be gets very interesting because what you have in Yemen now is a reassertion of s direct Saudi power. The Saudis until Yemen are mostly, with the exception of Bahrain where their tanks rolled in yeah. across the causeway, you know, uh, the Saudis are mostly operating behind the scenes with their regional foreign policy. Right. In the case of Yemen you have yeah. direct um, intervention. Yes, insinuation of right. force. And so, what, how do you see the Yemeni situation? I mean, just today there was a piece in the Washington Post by Ishan Tharoor arguing that this is not a sectarian uh, um, uh, conflict the way the Saudis would have you believe. This is not about Shia versus Sunni. This is about other things and the sectarian lens is, if anything, distorting mm -hmm. what's going on. Yeah. Well, there's a struggle for power there, in addition to the other elements you just mentioned, you know, because Keep in mind that uh, Yemen was a mess also in the 1960s under Nasser. Right. Nasser, you know, dealt with, with Yemen for 13 years, Egypt. Uh, so that, and then I think also the, the current mess in Yemen is also the fault of the Saudis who allowed the situation to fester and the instability and so on. Where will this all end? I have no idea. And by the way, this is the second time that the Saudis directly intervened. The first time was in Bahrain, by the way. That's right. Okay. To crush a popular uprising, That's which right. started as a non-sectarian and right. indeed cross-sectarian uprising, right. which the Saudis immediately portrayed as a, in an Iranian Shiite conspiracy. Right. Just right. the way Assad presented the Syrian uprising, which was also non-sectarian mm -hmm. at first, a very uh, serious cross-section of Syrian society. Mm -hmm. There were even Alawis, there were Armenians, there were Ismailis, Kurds, Druze, yeah. mm -hmm. Kurds and uh, secular people, all protesting in the name of dignity, democracy, and freedom. Right. And of course, what did the Assad regime say from day one? This is a, an Islamist, Saudi, foreign conspiracy, mm. terrorist, etc. Right. So in other words, the sectarian narrative operates on both sides. I think the sectarian narrative, we should not exaggerate it. I think it is used by the regimes to, to, to justify their, their rule, if you want, put it that way. Number two, don't forget that Arab regimes have used, if you want, uh, the Al-Qaeda or Islamist threat from the Muslim Brotherhood early on right. to tell the West, you see, we are guarantors of, of stability in the region. If you let us go, then you're going to have ISIS and Daesh and Al-Qaeda and all right. these people. Very cynical way of, of doing things and also playing on the, on the mistakes and the errors of the West. When, you know, the uh, Condoleezza Rice in 2005 in her speech in Cairo, the American University is stating that the United States for 30 years have favored stability at the expense of democracy, okay? And, and now it's time to change. Well, we see what's happening today. In Egypt, they are favoring, again, stability at the expense of democracy. The dictators are back and the yeah, US is on right. their side. And of course, our number one ally in the region after Israel remains Saudi Arabia which is not only the antithesis of a democracy, but it actively attempts yes. to roll back any democratic yes. changes yes, in of the course. region. And funds these groups. Yes. And funds these groups. And so the United States wants to have it both ways, Sorry. preaching the gospel of democracy, supporting the Saudi anti-democratic, counter-revolutionary yeah. uh, hegemon. And yet 
here we are, George, uh, to not end on a completely pessimistic note. You are a scholar of conflict resolution as well as Middle East studies. And so I'd like to just pick your brain a little bit about the prospects, in your view, of reversing these awful trends that we've been discussing. Is there any way of desectarianizing the political landscape of the Middle East in the, sometime in the near future? Or is the sectarian genie out of the bottle? Are these forces that have been unleashed in the last few years with the toppling of Saddam Hussein, the occupation of Iraq, the Syrian civil war, these various conflicts that we see in Yemen and so forth, is, 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 is this a, a runaway train, George, or is there any way to de-escalate? Well, uh, that, this, is, this is another, we can stay here for five hours to discuss this. It's a long uh, issue. First of all, I disagree that the Middle East is being sect sectarianized. Uh, example is that in Iraq, for instance, Shia and Sunnis were intermarrying. Right. Okay. Uh, they were jointly, you know, working together. Especially what? in cities like Baghdad, Even but all over the country. Right, yeah. that's, that's one. Two, the same happened in, 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 in Syria too. For sure. Okay, as in the case of Lebanon. Certainly, certainly, as I said before, you don't have the sense of national identity, except for the Palestinians. But, uh, but in a sense, we have to be careful about not generalizing about that. Certainly, the, the, the clan... Uh, family, tribal affiliation still plays a prominent role because the state is absent. Back to Lebanon. Right. Today, for instance, Lebanon has been a year almost, has not elected a president of the republic. Okay. Uh, Lebanon has a government. Each member of the government has its own fiefdom and they fight each other. And, and, but the country is running. Uh, despite the fact that you have two million Syrian refugees, for a population of four million, which is a mess. Huge. Uh, you have the fact that every year Lebanon receives more than seven billion dollars in remittances from the Lebanese diaspora in Brazil right. and Africa and so on and so forth. So it's a country that is still survive that a civil society that is still viable in terms of keeping that in mind. Uh, back to historical perspective, and I think that as a student of internationalism, I'm not an expert. I don't think you never become an expert until the day you die. <laughs> but basically, as a student of international relations, go back to history. How long, many centuries it took for Europe, the European states, to emerge? How many wars? How much blood rolled? The Thirty Years' War, the French-Prussian Wars, World War I, World War II, uh, the Holocaust. Okay, it was not until 1944 when the, the U.S. Marines uh, landed in, in Normandy that, in a sense, the new order emerged, if, if it was Pax Americana emerged, stopping Europeans from their madness. And the madness still goes on. The latest example of that was the former Yugoslavia, what right. happened, you know, Serbs, Croats, and they hate each other still while they are almost the same root, uh, they speak almost the same language, Slavic people. But when you talk to a Croat and tell him, why don't you you know, befriend the, the, the Serbs, you know, no, they're, they're, we have history there, there's a lot of, there is a lot back to conflict resolution. Yes. We have a lot of sense of victimization. Absolutely. Which leads to these kind of, of, of behaviors, in addition to blind foreign leaders who don't care too much about these people. And basically, uh, they, they also the fecklessness and stupidity of the regional leaders who don't care about their people. That's the tragedy. And I think at the global level today, we have a leadership crisis. If you look today at the map of the world, who do we have? We don't have people the stature of uh, John Kennedy or David I I Dwight Eisenhower or, or uh, De Gaulle in France or Adenauer in, in, in Germany uh, or uh, Nyerere in Tanzania or Nkrumah in Ghana, uh, Tito in the former Yugoslavia. We don't have that. We have, in a sense, some kind of a wimpish crowd, basically, that includes, you know, the Prime Minister, President of Spain, uh, Rajoy, and the Spaniards are going to be, not be happy with this, <laughs> or, uh, you know, the Hollande in France. Uh, well, Merkel was compared to the Pharaoh <laughs> by the Spaniards because they compared Angela her, Merkel. Yeah, because she said that she brought the f seven plagues, to, especially <laughs> to Spain and Italy and, and Greece. But, but, and of course, let's not talk about the bailiwick here in the United States where, you know, unfortunately in the White House, we have a leader, we have a quasi-leader who I think that we should not blame Obama because Obama came with a domestic agenda. 
And I think that his legacy is going to be mostly the, the, uh, the ACA, the, the medical, the new Medicare, Medicare. And, and so arguably on. the Iranian nuclear deal. And inshallah that, that, that would work out. But he, Obama is not the man with you know, the, the foreign you know, uh, visions. Because if you go, for instance, even to Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon, it was you know, Kissinger who pushed him to China, who pushed him towards you know, the, the, you know, the stopping the Vietnam War, despite all the <coughs> massacres that happened, so on and so forth. And the Shanghai community. And the Shanghai and so on. And in this case, basically, we have this you know, very, very, so we have a, a transitional stage at the global level. Of course, this is affecting. I'm not pessimistic because I teach uh, young people, Kuwaitis and others, and I see that they are a very smart bunch. And I see that there is hope there. And these folks will not accept in the long run to be dominated or, or be, you know, refuse their basic rights and so on. And I think it's going to be a matter of time. Okay, and fi fi last but not least, there's the whole issue about religion, but I don't want to get there. Basic is a very important issue of what, how, is there a possibility to separate faith from governance, deen, wadawla, religion, religion and state. Uh, the other issue, also very important, we should not forget it, is the status of women in the Arab world today, which are really playing a very important role. And, you know, struggling to, 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 to educate themselves, get involved. In Kuwait, we have, there are four members of parliament are women, and uh, have the highest rate of divorce in the world, by the way, in Kuwait. Uh, and thirdly, the question about being tolerant towards the other, acknowledging the other. And I think, the, I will end it here, I will end it with a famous article by the late Edward Said, Palestinian-American scholar, who when Samuel Huntington came out with his famous book, The Clash of Civilization, Edward Said wrote back an other interesting, scathing review of the book, entitling his article, The Clash of Ignorance. Mm -hmm. And this is basically, I think this, I think this is the role of your center and us in teaching or whatever, to try to fight this ignorance, that's the thing. George, it's been absolutely marvelous having you on uh, our program today and hosting you this last week as a visiting scholar of our Center for Middle East Studies, and I look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you.